All right, so a little bit about me. Thank you for the introduction. I, I did go to Loyola. I graduated in 2010. I started out as a financial advisor working with a certified financial planner, CFP. Started then working with an RIA, Registered Investment Advisory firm. From there, I then branched off, started my own company. When I got accepted in the booth, I realized I wanted a little bit more hands-on experience with investing. So I started a hedge fund. It was a blend of options trading with some real estate, more residential real estate. As I was taking classes at Booth, I took two commercial real estate classes and realized how much I enjoyed it. And I started to tilt the hedge fund away from options trading. So less hedge fund, more getting the private equity fund as we transition to more illiquid assets. And so when COVID hit, I pretty much transitioned most of that, the funds from options trading, so cash, very liquid into real estate. Did that for about two years, three years. And then at the end of, I would say December, 2021, we closed on a number of properties and interest rates were very low at that, that point. I think our last property we closed on had the interest rate was a little over 3%. So much, much different than the rates right now, which are anywhere from six, six and a half, even up to seven and a half, depending on, depending on which bank you're using. So very, very different risk profile. So back in December, 2021, I said, well, I'm not that bullish on the commercial real estate market right now, just from a risk return standpoint, rates are going to rise. Cap rates, right, aren't, we're, we're on the low end. And so I, I asked myself, well, what else could we invest in? What else do I have expertise in? And that's when accounting practices popped up and I started getting, analyzing those, those firms to see if the risk profile is worth it. I reconnected with, a colleague from my MBA and we evaluated some accounting practices and we said, Hey, the, the returns are very good relative to risk. So then we partnered, we formed GJM advisory and we've acquired the last couple of years, we've acquired a couple of accounting practices. So that's, I would say is my primary job right now is overseeing those two accounting practices. I still run the real estate fund. And I, I was, as I will mention, I, I was an adjunct, but just with some other things going on in my life, I had to back away from teaching a little bit, but I'm still pretty, pretty involved with, with the commercial real estate. So I am actually starting options training up again. So kind of doing a little bit, a little bit of everything at this point, but today focused on, on real estate, specifically commercial. But my first example I wanted to walk through is residential, because I think people understand that a little bit more. And I think it's a little bit more applicable right now to you guys. So I just want to walk through an example that I usually walk or that I used to walk my students through. So we have a residential example. You bought a primary residence in 1998. You bought it for 385,000. You sold it for 635. That's 24 years. It looks like you made a decent amount of money, right? almost 250,000. And you're thinking, well, this is why everyone buys real estate. It goes up, right? There's no downturn. It's a great investment, right? So everyone, you know, let's take a minute and think about this, right? Is this, did you actually make 250,000? Right? Well, then the question is, oh, awesome. let's see. Okay. So someone said no. So absolutely. Yep. So you didn't necessarily make 250,000. So let's, let's break it down. Right. So then let me share my other screen. So moving away from this. Oh, uh, well, can you see my other screen? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So here's an Excel file here. All right. So we have to look at the cost that you incurred throughout that 24 years. So you have to have insurance every year. So let's just say the okay. average about a thousand dollars and then so for repairs let's assume so for repairs you have about two thousand dollars so this is a single family home single family home are going to you're going to have more repairs than a condo because with a condo you have the association uh, dues and that are supposed to cover a lot of your repairs 
right? So single family homes, you're going to have more appliances break. You have real estate taxes, you have utilities, you have the acquisition and disposition costs, right? You have the commissions of 5% when you sell. Usually when you buy, you don't have to pay commissions. That is actually changing. So I'm selling my condo right now. And I think there is, yeah, I haven't looked directly into the regulations, but at this point, now buyers are responsible for paying their realtor fees. Now you would think then that the seller then doesn't have to pay it, but what happens now is the buyer is then negotiating for a credit on the closing statement in order to offset that. So you put so the government they put in these regulations, and then you see the market is already trying to get around something like that. All right. So we right here I have the loan amortization schedule. So this is over the 24 years. So other than these carry our carry costs, so we have the insurance, we have the repairs, we have the taxes, we have the utilities, you have the commissions that you're going to pay. So other than that, we then have probably our biggest expense, which is the interest. All right. So let's then come over here, do the calculation. All right. So we started off with 635000 We pay 5% on real estate commissions. We have our closing costs. So those, so right there, we're already chopping away almost 42,000 from the 635, right? So then we have the 593. And this is assuming after or before the loan payoff. So then what I'm doing here is this is 24 years of our costs over here, right? So all I'm doing here is multiplying these by 24. And you can see then that over the course of the 24 years, right, we have about 600,000 of carry costs, right? Now this, this 150,000, so this example actually came from a friend who back in 2022, I was talking to, and he mentioned that his father had sold the home, his family home. And so he also mentioned that they, during that time period, they put in about 150,000 of renovations. So what we're seeing is then your all in costs here, right? Is over 1.1 million, all right? So initially when you're thinking, I'll just bring this over right here. Initially you're thinking, well, I bought it for 385,000. But if you're not tracking all of your expenses throughout the year, right? You're drastically understating your, your return or you say, I should say your loss, right? So you go from thinking you're making 250,000 to now, right? You have a loss of 547,000. This isn't to dissuade you from buying real estate. It's just more to make you aware that, especially your primary real estate, it's less of an investment and it's more the lesser of two evils. All right. So you might think, well, why would anyone buy a primary residence then if you're going to lose that much money? Well, the, the answer then is it's still less expensive than renting. And so when I calculate it out, that cost is about $1,500 a month that you would pay in, in, in rent. And so the question is, well, could you get, could you rent a single family home for $1,500 on average, $1,500 for 24 years? The answer is no. So it's less of an investment, but it is, there is still cost savings. So the point there is you just have to make sure that you're aware of all the variables when you're thinking about real estate. So for me, my primary residence, I've looked at that more as an investment because I also rent it out. And so a lot of people, when they have primary residence, a lot of times that's to avoid having roommates or they have a family. And so you're not going to have, have, uh, be able to have renters. But there's ways that you can use your primary residence more for an investment. But generally speaking, unless you're renting it out and you have renters, it's less of an investment and it's more of the lesser two evils. Let me go back to sharing my other one. All right. So now that we went through that residential analysis, right? Let's let's jump into commercial. So the one thing I talked and would explain to my students is if you can only remember one thing from my class, 
remember what the cap rate is, right? Because this is used very frequently in the commercial real estate industry. So when you're thinking of the cap rate, right, all it is is net operating income of next year, right, divided by either the purchase price or the fair market value of that. So it gives you a form of a yield. So similar to like a dividend yield, right? So with a dividend yield, you're just thinking of the dividends divided by the stock price. This is very similar. So this cap rate is in essence saying, what is this specific property? What is it yielding to you as the owner? It's also, so a couple of things is it's, it's unlevered and with the net operating income, it doesn't factor in something like CapEx. So I say it doesn't factor in CapEx, 99% of the time it doesn't. So there is still some subjectivity. I've rarely seen a cap rate that's listed that have CapEx, but you just have to be aware of what is in the numerator. 99% it's not going to be CapEx, but just you just have to be aware of that in, in the industry. So I'll, I'll touch on things like that because a lot of times people... And we'll see this with when when we get into leases with triple nets is sometimes it's a misnomer because it says triple net, but it's really not a triple net. So just like all things in real estate, take it with a grain of salt, do the research. But when you're looking at the cap rate, it's generally going to be net operating income divided by the fair market value or the listed price. All right, so this is something more that I would tell my students when they would do a financial projection is they would say, okay, we'll buy it at a 7% cap rate and then it will grow for two years. Don't think of it like that either. Don't think of it linearly of, hey, we'll just get obtain 2% growth rate on the property. Think of it as what's your acquisition cap rate and what's your disposition cap rate, right? So think of it from that standpoint. Don't think of it as I bought it for a million and I expect it to grow 2% every year, right? That's disc that there's a disconnect between all of the variables that go in. Think of it more from I'll buy it at a 7% cap rate and then I'll sell it at a 6.5% cap rate. So with cap rates, if the cap rate goes down, that means that your price has appreciated. If the cap rate goes up, that means your, your property has depreciated and gone down in value. All right, so criteria for investing. So what do I look for? So again, keep in mind, this is more from my, from my background. I'm a very unorthodox private equity manager, real estate investor, right? So again, keep in mind, this is how I look at it. This is what's important to me. It doesn't mean that this is how the, in, the rest of the industry works, right? But this is just from my experience, what I care about. And again, as I've explained, my background is kind of diverse. So my my train of thought, my reasoning can be very, very different. All right. So to me, the number one important thing when I'm looking at a commercial property is the tenant. All right. So I look at it, at, and this is me maybe more getting into private equity standpoint, as opposed to just a real estate investor is I look at it is I would love to have ownership in a dental practice, All right? But I can't just go out and buy ownership in a dental practice. Right? I can't just walk into a dentist's office and say, hey, I want 10% equity of your company. They're, they're not going to, most likely they're not going to sell it to me. Right? And it can be very hard to actually invest in the private equity space. It can be hard to invest directly into a medical practice. You have to set up like a, a management service operation. So MSO, you have to set up an MSA management service agreement. So there's a lot of legality in a non-medical professional having ownership in there. So I look at when I'm looking at commercial properties, though, I'm looking at it as if I'm the landlord and I have a medical practice, they are, they're contractually obligated to give me rent for a certain period of time. And a lot of times with medical leases and medical prices, they're signing leases that are like 15 years, 20 years. So in essence, I am getting, I'm indirectly getting ownership in their in their company and it's actually secure because it's contract as opposed to equity right that's that's less secure so when i'm looking at a tenant medical to me is very it's very high because it's very safe dental practices right that they may seem like they're everywhere but financially they they do they do very well 
as opposed to, let's say, in urgent care. Not to say in urgent care can't do well, but when you think of a dental practice versus an urgent care, dental practice, much higher margins that you can get. So you, sometimes they, they can do surgery, they, they, they can do the sc uh, scanning. So a lot of, the, a lot of the, the services that they can offer can be several hundred, if not several thousand dollars. When you think of an urgent care, right? When you stop in there, a lot of times you're talking about like $50, $75, $100 test. So the margins are much lower. So the turnover ratio needs to be much higher, right? And so if you have too many of these urgent cares popping up, they're just going to, they're, they're just going to cannibalize each other. So that's one reason why I like something like dental, much higher than, than an urgent care. So even though I say medical, right? You still have to be cognizant of what type of medical are you getting into. So another one is something specialized like a daycare, All right? A daycare, one of the reasons I like that is the type of building that you're getting when you get a daycare. So you have to go through an inspection and well, like a daycare inspection. So not necessarily you hire an inspector to make sure the property is, is, is solid. So that's kind of like a real estate inspector. I'm not talking about that there's compliance inspectors that walk through these daycares and they look at every single foot of the room and get it qualified. And you also have only so many children per room per square foot. So the regulations are much higher when you're getting a daycare. And for to get it to be qualified to be considered a daycare, you're in essence getting something at you're 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 getting something at fair market value, but really there's a premium to it because it's qualified as a daycare. Further, that daycare, if at the end of their lease, right, they want to move, it's very hard for them to transition to another building because again, it, it takes a lot for a building, for a property to be, to pass an inspection, to be a daycare. So they can't, so unlike an office uh, building where you can have cubicles, you know, you have a 10 by 10 room and you set up five, you have five, five cubicles, unlike something like that, you can't just move the daycare somewhere. So you really lock in the tenant. So anything that really locks you in, I really like those, those properties. That's the same with going back to medical, for example. Medical, if you've been in dentist office, dentist office, uh, you know, a primary care physician, they're they're set up, they have a lot of medical equipment attached. It's all throughout throughout the office. So it's not easy for them to, to move a medical facility, right? There's a lot of tenant improvements that occur to get them in there. So with a dentist, with daycare, right, you really lock them in because of the building type. Whereas when you're looking at an office sector, it's just, it's much easier for them to go down the street to another office building. It's also much easier for them to simply work remotely, right? But with medical, you, you, had, you had to, people feel most comfortable going in to the medical facility. I know people do the, 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 telemedical or whatever that's whatever that's called where they, they're on the phone or on the zoom but 90 you know, 90 percent of people still want to be in person with the doctor when they're going through going through exams in daycare obviously the children have to be in in the daycare right that's not something that can be that can be remote so then another another tenant that i like is the dollar general right so the sole provider in that area so with groceries so when you look at a Dollar General store, right, you, they're bread and butter. So they can be, you know, there's 15,000 locations that Dollar General has. So they are in major cities, but their bread and butter is really going to a very rural spot, planting their flag and saying, hey, this is our spot. The population is only like a thousand. So once they're there, it doesn't make sense. Even if they're not there, it doesn't make sense for someone like Walmart to come in and put a super center there. Right. It's just too, it's too large. Their, their building, their cost is too large for such a small population. So Dollar General really thrives when they go to small population areas and are the sole provider of groceries. They can even partner, or I shouldn't say partner, but they can even work with a more local grocery store that has produce and things like that. And they can actually help each other and there's synergies there. So they don't have to be the only grocery store there. But what, what you don't want to see is the Dollar General getting into more, more urban, more suburbs where you get, once you get into like populations of 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 
I personally, I stay away from that. Again, they, I see them all the time there, but I look at it as what's their bread and butter? What's their sweet spot? Where are they strongest? And the Dollar General is strongest in a very rural area. And so when I started looking at Dollar Generals, this was when COVID happened, I actually was a little timid because of that, because I was looking at the trade reports. I'm saying, hey, this population, it's only 800. It's only 1,000. What if Dollar General leaves? But And I just had to become more and more comfortable with the Dollar General model and, and one, say, well, one, why would they leave? They're the only provider in that area. They they have they have three employees at max working the entire store. So even on a million dollars of revenue, they're still making a lot of money coming through on a population of only 500, 800. So once I became more comfortable with the dollar general model, I then started looking at dollar generals. And so we bought the last few years, we bought two, we bought two stores, one in Michigan and then one in New York. So besides the tenant, right? Well, let me actually, let me back up real quick going about. So I was highlighting the positives of Dollar General. Let's look at the negatives of some of the other competitors real quick. Family Dollar, right? I think most of you have seen a Family Dollar and Dollar Tree. So Dollar Tree actually bought Family Dollar. The benefit of Dollar Tree is that they were, at one point, they, everything was a dollar or less recently. In the last like, couple of years, they technically broke the buck, and now everything is like a dollar twenty-five or something like that. So still very cheap, right? But in, in a lot of times when you see Dollar Trees, you actually see them in the same parking lot of Walmart. So they try to, for lack of a better term, they try to leech on to a, a Walmart, something like that, to get the, to get the parking and get that, that foot traffic there. But Dollar Tree, everything is still very cheap, $1.25. Dollar General, things aren't actually a dollar. Things are $10, $15, $20, $30. They just have that dollar in their, in their name. But they are good in rural areas. So Dollar General, good in rural areas. Dollar Tree, very cheap. Everything's $1.25, let's see. Let's say. And then you have Family Dollar. Family Dollar right, is neither of the two. They're kind of the worst of both worlds. And so you actually have seen them really struggle. And so several years ago, like back when, you know, 2019, so before COVID hit, I was, I was sent a lot of these OMs, offering memorandums on family dollars. And so that's when I started doing the research. And these family dollars, it's just, to me, at least, it's, it's a poor business model because you're not, you're not cheap like Dollar Tree, and then you're not in rural areas where you're the sole provider, like a dollar general. So you're just in this middle ground where things are still five, 10, $15. And you have to ask yourself, why would someone go to a family dollar versus a Walmart? Right. So that's kind of, so the negatives of the competitors are kind of the positives of, of why I like dollar general is they have a very good business model saying, Hey, this is what we're good at dollar tree. They acquired family dollar and it's really gone it's really gone poorly for them so be, so tenant number one lease to me is the number two so when i talk about lease there's a few things so one i want years remaining so i've changed these slides a couple of times over the last couple of years right it used to be closer to five or six was fine now i've started raising up to seven or eight I probably wouldn't even really get in it if it doesn't have at least eight or nine. For So what I have here, so if, if medical is next to a hospital, then I'd accept five years. So that's getting a little bit into location, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So there are exceptions to the seven years, eight year rule. But just keep in mind that when a commercial property is vacant or it goes vacant, so let's say your tenant moves out, it can take a long time for you to find another tenant. So it's not like residential real estate where maybe you own a four flat in Chicago. So that means you have four units. One of the tenants moves out. It's April. So if it's April and the tenant moves out, you're immediately going to find another tenant, right? So the, the sweet spot for renting uh, residential is between, let's say, March and June, specifically April and May. So maybe even less than a month, if even that. Whereas you get a commercial property and you lose your tenant, whether they go bankrupt, whether they moved out, 
it can take on average, I think it's nine months, something like that. And that's, that's the average time. And then you also have to think of how specialized is your building. So this is in the negative. So I said, hey, being a special, you know, specialized property like a daycare, right? That's that's good. Unless then they move out. And then once they moved out, now you can really only accept another daycare. And so what are the chances that another daycare is going to be there? So then you might have to renovate your, your property and convert it to something else. So you just have to be cognizant of how many years remaining. Because if you get 10 years and your tenant moves out, you're in a much better financial position than if you only had three years and then the tenant moves out. It's another reason why I don't like the office sector is in general with the office sector, they only have to sign three-year leases. The typical is three to five. So it's much lower than my, than my threshold. So besides years, what you want to look at is the type of lease. So what I mean there is, is it triple net? You have, you have modified gross, you have triple net, you have double, double nets, you have absolute triple net. So you have all these different, all this different jargon that floats around. Again, you have to read the lease to, to look at it, but usually what triple net means is that the tenant will pay for real estate taxes, they will pay for insurance. And they'll pay for your common area maintenance. So basic repairs, small repairs, right? If something like the roof breaks or let's say a tree falls on it, falls on the roof, you have to repair the roof. Usually that's on you as a landlord and lets it, unless it's an absolute triple net lease. So it's a, if it's an absolute triple net lease, then the tenant has to replace every single thing that breaks and every single thing that happens. Now, it does sound good to have an absolute triple net lease, but the only concern there is the tenant's not really motivated to keep it up because it's on them to fix everything. So they'll try to just kick the can down the road. So, you know, let's say a tree doesn't fall on the roof, but the roof needs repairs, right? They might just keep on delaying, delaying, delaying. They'll keep on patching. They'll avoid doing what's necessary. And then if their lease is up, they might say, hey, it's not worth it to spend $70,000 on a new roof. We're going to move out. So then in order to entice them, then you have to, in essence, just give a, a concession and pay for pay for the roof anyway. So then you had lower rent because lower rent usually occurs if it's an absolute triple net. But then you end up having to front the money anyway to keep the tenant. So you just have to be constant of those type of risks to say, Hey, an absolute triple net where the tenant pays for every single expense. That sounds great. But then what are the chances of them leaving and kicking the can down the road and not actively repairing and replacing what needs to occur? So then you also look at rent escalation. So in the lease, you want to look at how often do you have inflation bumps? So, so here, typically you're looking at something like 2%, 2% especially with the inflation that's been going on the last few years, 2% sounds very low, but I would say it's very hard to get anything but two to 3%. Maybe if you can negotiate the uh, CPI uh, index for, for the, for the inflation bumps, for the rent bumps that that's possible. But a lot of times that only happened, you know, pre all the pre all this inflation, right? Now that the inflation has been high, very rarely would a tenant agree to lock in to some CPI indicator for, for the rent. So most likely you're going to get two to 3%, but you have to be careful there because that two to 3% is actually very important. 2% doesn't sound like a lot, but that's where a lot of the appreciation is going to come from when you're looking at your, your property. And so something like someone like a dollar general store, when you read the lease, it says every option term. So an option term is them renewing. So at the end of their lease, Dollar General can renew for five years. And if they renew for five years, they'll get a 10% rent increase, All right? So the Dollar General store that we own, they've been there since I think 2007, 2008. They've gone through four lease renewals. And those four lease renewals said that there should be a 10% increase. Guess how many times they've actually increased? Zero. So even though it's in the lease, what Dollar General ends up saying and doing is saying, well, we'll renew, but we're not going to renew and take that 10% you know, hit. And we're not, our rent is not going to go up 10%. And so you as a landlord, 
right? Unless you want to roll the dice and call their bluff, then you end up just conceding and saying, fine, we won't increase the rent 10% as long as you stay. Because again, keep in mind, these are very rural locations. So if Dollar General does happen to move, which again, I don't know the likelihood of them moving, but let's just say they call your bluff and they say, fine, we're moving. Now you're in essence stuck with a box that has very little value in it. So getting, that's just, we'll, we can get into that a little bit later with the risk, but that's something you just have to be very cognizant of when you're looking at these leases is just because it stipulates something in the lease, you have to look at the, the history of that lease. And so when I, when I bought these Dollar General stores, I looked at the history. So I factored that in that, hey, they're not actually going to increase every five years Right? It's going to be something maybe every 20 years or or if that. So you just have to be constant and look at how often the, has a tenant renewed. And then if they have renewed, how often is their rent actually increasing per the lease? So let me just pause right there. Any Any questions? All right. Uh, Adam, I have a question. Okay. Uh, yeah. So what is the difference between rent and lease? Yeah. So good question. So lease, look at the lease as a contract. A lease stipulates things like the rent. So it stipulates things. What is the rent? So is it 5,000 a month? Is it, is it 4,000 a month? It also stipulates who pays for what. So in the industry, people use terms like triple net lease, but in the actual lease, in the actual contract, it doesn't, there's not a line item that actually says this is a triple net lease. You almost have to de de deduct that from, deduce that from the, from the lease by reading who is actually responsible. So you have to use deduction to get to that of, is this a triple net? Is this not a triple net? The lease also stipulates things like what are the inflation bumps? How long is the lease? What are the, what are the renewal options? It says what happens if there's damage to the property. So a lot of times if there's catastrophic damage to the property and it's going to, and more than 50% of the property is, is destroyed and it's going to take more than six months to repair, that actually gives, usually that can give the tenant a way out and they can actually exit the lease. So the lease is really just a legal contract that then stipulates all these things like rent. And so a lot of times when you're the tenant, you're not just paying rent, you're paying, usually paying things like common air maintenance, like real estate taxes, like insurance. And then I think there was something in chat. Okay. So property tax appraisal for commercial real estate seems very complex. Is it based on land value, building value, cash flow of landlord slash tenant? So the answer is it depends. <laughs> it it can be based on so let's just say we have a a multi residential four flat. Technically, that could be considered either residential or commercial. You're supposed to value that based off the the building, but the building type, right? Not factoring in the net operating income. But what the city ends up doing, you know, city as in Cook County, they end up valuing it using that income. So you do kind of get hit with a higher, with a higher, with a higher real estate appraisal value because of that. I've looked at it's also based on when it last sold. So as long as your property is not selling, right, that will help keep the keep the property down. So I know it's not a great answer, but it really it really does depend, and it's really kind of outside of your control. So me personally, I haven't spent too much trying time trying to analyze that. I've reached out there, so there's real estate tax attorneys that will appraise uh, the not appraise, but they'll they'll appeal for the the taxes of of what seems reasonable, and then usually they only you only have to pay them if there's tax savings. So when there is some exorbitant tax increase, I've usually gone to them. And with commercial properties, though, so I think I've reached out on four of the commercial properties I've had. And in those four times, the the tax attorneys who all the they're motivated to to get that to get that uh, assessment value down, 
all four times the attorney looked at the property, did a brief analysis and said, hey, there's not a lot we can do. So on the commercial side, it, it, you're kind of stuck with whatever the, the the county says. On the residential side, the the several times I've been active with that, there have been there have been appeals and they have gone down. So it's a lot easier to appeal. It, at least my experience, it's been easier to appeal on the residential side than it has the commercial side. All right. So then the next question is triple net lease common in commercial estate. Yeah. So I would say, well, I say it's common because that's generally what I look for. And I really don't look at an OM that's not uh, some version of triple net, but I've looked at hundreds and thousands of, of leases. And so a lot of them are some form of a triple net. This is where, again, the jargon gets confusing because like the dollar general stores, I consider those triple net, but when they are sent to me in the OM, they the, the realtor calls it like a double net lease uh, because I think their rationale is that it doesn't cover roof and structure, but then I call that absolute triple net. So that's why it gets a little confusing with this because there's not necessarily a legal term that says, hey, this is triple net, this is not. That's why you have to read the lease to say, hey, if the roof breaks, who's responsible for it? If the HVAC breaks, who's responsible for it? If there's a plumbing issue, who's responsible for it? If there's electrical, who's responsible for it? So you just have to read that lease and see and see who is actually responsible. Because I've gotten into some reading these leases that uh, the realtor tells me one thing, they say it's an absolute triple net. I then read the lease and I say, wait a second, this says right here, if there's some damage to the roof or the foundation, then the tenant has to, or then the landlord has to replace that. So it's not an absolute triple net. So you just have to, you just have to, unfortunately, you just have to read the, read the lease and, and see what's actually in that legal contract. So any, any other questions before we continue on? No. Okay. All right, so top two things I look at in, in a commercial real estate property, we have the tenant and then we have the lease, right? The next ones, we had the cap rate. So when I say cap rate, in essence, what this is saying is price, right? So I'm still, so price is important, but to me, it's not the most important thing. You know, to, with a great tenant, with a great lease, I'm willing to be flexible on my, on my, on my purchase price. So in 2024, so again, this is something that has changed over the years. In 2024, seven and a half to eight and a half percent would give you a quality property. I probably wouldn't entertain anything below an eight percent cap rate right now, where the interest rates were. When you're factoring a seventy percent loan to value, an eight and a half percent cap rate with you know seven percent interest rate, six and a half percent interest rate, you're still close to like an eighteen to nineteen percent IRR, depending on some other variables. But usually, that's good enough. For me to say hey yeah it's worth getting involved in this the flip side though is you have to be aware of possible risk because let's say a cap rate is nine and a half in the in this market right it's nine and a half why would i not want to jump immediately on that so nine and a half percent cap rate that would be a great buy in essence that's saying it's a low price relative to the noy that you're obtaining right so why would you not want to jump into that and so it should you, this is the, the properties I'm looking at are nationwide, right? So the entire U.S. is looking and sees this property. It's not like it's just me, right? All of a sudden I stumbled on this property. No one knows about it. The entire U.S. can see this property. And the entire U.S. is saying, well, hey, I don't want to bid on this property. So therefore the price is dropping and dropping and dropping, right? So alarm bells should be going off when you see too high of a cap rate. And a lot, of, so you see these all the time. And a lot of times it's because it goes back to the lease, right? A lot of times it's because there's only two, three years remaining in that lease. So the seller knows in order to entice the buyer for possible risk that the tenant might leave, right? I have to lower my price. So to me, right, it's still not worth, you know, a 10% cap rate, it's still not worth that low price if it only has two to three years remaining on that because I don't want to deal with finding a new tenant. I don't want to deal with having to possibly renovate this property to entice a completely new tenant in there. So you just have to be worried about too, too low of a price and that just set off alarm bells. 
So the building type. So this is a little bit overlapped with the with the with the tenant because obviously a certain tenant can only use a certain building type. So to me, this is mostly just saying not office. <laughs> and this was this was even before COVID hit, right? So even before all the remote working, I kind of knew that the that the your barrier to entry, your 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 tenant, it's so easy for them to move out and move down the street and put up cubicles in that open warehouse, any, any, anywhere. And so I've always avoided office space, right? A lot of times where you see in the past where you've seen a lot of office, office space do well is you see like these huge skyscrapers and you see these big players like, like Blackstone and they get in when there's a distress seller. So to me, that's probably the only time that I would entertain getting into office is if I was at a, if I was working with Blackstone and we're in the financial crisis and we're buying a, from a distress seller, to me, that's the only, that's the only time that I would, I would entertain office. All right. Can you talk about real estate trends in downtown Chicago? Is the commercial market more challenging than, more? is the commercial market more challenging than the retail sector? So is are you are you asking if the office sector is, is more challenging than the retail sector? Yes. Yeah. So uh, so let's think about this. So retail encompasses a decent amount of service, like restaurants and bars and experience. And I think those have been coming back for the younger for the younger generations. So I would still prefer retail over over office because you're seeing you again you you're seeing a lot more you at least pre-COVID. I know it's kind of in this flux where now employers are wanting people to come back. And so there is less remote working than at let's say at the peak of the of, of the COVID, but you're still you're there's still gonna be a percentage that are that are always going to be remote working for forever now. Now that employers have seen that, now that employees have seen that, right, there's going to be a much larger percentage that are always going to be remote. So with retail, the good retail, I, I guess I'd say it that way is the good retail is still very worth getting into. So even even the malls, so people think of think of malls and they think, oh, they're dead. Well, those are like the class C, the class D, even the class B malls, right? But the class A malls are still very, very successful. And there's still a lot of foot traffic. So with retail, it's not necessarily about avoiding retail like the plague, kind of like the office for, for me. For me, it would be about being very specific about retail. Is I would entertain retail depending on you know, depending on the area. I mean, think about West Loop, for example, right? When you're on when you're on Randolph Street, right? That you know, those that section is doing very well. So I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily rule out retail the way I rule out office. So would that reset a new lower ceiling for the cap rates? We hear that there may be a cliff in 2026 because a lot of commercial leases are up. You know, I, that cliff that people are talking about, they, they were talking about that in 2020. So they're seeing 2024, right? 2025. So I, I, it could be possible. You could see a lot of, a lot of, again, Going back to office, you could see a lot of office space becoming become available, but I think that's being mitigated a little bit because in, because of the fact that employers are trying to pull back and demand employees to come back to the office. So I don't think it's I wouldn't call it a cliff. I think it's been slowly occurring since COVID happened because these leases. It's not like everyone started their lease in 2020. Right. So it's everyone's lease was was varied. And so I think we've seen that variation occur. So I don't think there's anything special about 2026. Offices, again, the tip, typical lease for offices is three to five years. So we're, you know, even in 2020, right, 2025 will be the fifth year. So we've already gone through four years and it would have been stagnant with all those different, all those different employers. So I, I personally don't think there's going to be a cliff and I've heard of this cliff happen ever since 2020 and it hasn't, hasn't happened yet. So I don't, I don't personally think there's going to be something in 2026.
All right, so the last criteria. So I have five criteria. The last one is location. All right, so I'm not biased. To, okay, so maybe I guess I should have updated these slides a little bit. I, I say I'm not biased towards any state except Florida. <laughs> all right, I do not want to buy in Florida because of the all the natural disasters, all the hurricanes. Every year something is happening, and it when you think of a commercial property and you think of a hurricane hitting even once every 15 years that still is very damaging to the financial to the financials so it doesn't make it worth it to deal with a nightmare every even 15 years and a lot of times these cities are getting hit every 10 years sometimes even every five years right and so on on the commercial side you lose your tenant as well because most likely it's going to take more it could i shouldn't say most likely it could take longer than six months to rebuild that property and usually if it's if you have absolute catastrophic uh, damage to your property the lease allows the tenant to exit and so because of that now you're left with just at this point now you're left with land obviously you have insurance so they're going to so it's not like it's completely gone but you're going to take that insurance check. You're going to have to rebuild from scratch. Costs because of, because of inflation, costs have gone up. Now you can say, well, the the insurance should have gone up to cover that. Probably not as like your premium probably didn't go up as much as the as the the actual construction costs have. So you could run into an issue where where you need more money. So I just I really just don't want to get into a natural disaster state. So to me, Florida when I see, or even anything really on the coast, when I see something by coast, it just, it, I just don't think it's worth the, worth the headache. It's just not like I, I can invest anywhere in the U S why invest in something that could possibly be, be, be a headache. So other than that, I would say I would go in any state or any area. It really depends on, on the neighborhood. So if you are, for example, if you're, if you find a medical building right across the street from a hospital, that will change a lot of things. So as my prior slides alluded to, I would take a five-year lease with a medical tenant if they're right across from the hospital, because even if that medical tenant leaves, you're going to get another medical practitioner in there right away because of the hospital, because of foot traffic, because of the patients that are there. So location does matter. It's not that it doesn't, it's just, it's simply fifth on my list because there's a lot of other things that, that you need to, to get into that. So would you apply the same thing? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So it's Southern California and Carolinas. Yeah. So any, any, I mean, I guess less the Carolinas, I know that just happened and that those are kind of anomalies. So I, before the disaster that occurred, I would not have specifically stayed away from the Carolinas. I would stay away from coastal. So I would have gone more inland and I would have thought that, that um, I think it was Asheville that in, in, in Carolina that, that got hit. I would have thought that that would have been safe, but again, there, there are those anomalies, but so yeah, California overall one, it's just very pricey. So it'd be hard to, 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 to find, to find the property. But yeah, I would say, I'd say California is maybe two or three on the least favorite states that I would have with, with investing. But, you know, let's say something like Detroit, for example, a lot of people stay away from that, but I was entertaining a dental practice or a dental uh, building with a dental practice in there right across the street from a hospital in Detroit. So something like that, I would still entertain. I know a lot of people, they hear Detroit and they hear real estate and they're like, what, what would you be doing there? Why would you take that risk? But again, it's right by a hospital and it's a medical building. So most of the time I'm pretty, I'm pretty flexible with that. So again, I know this is more, this is more residential real estate. When you hear location, 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 right? You hear realtors say that all the time. Again, there's, it's not that it doesn't matter, but to me, there's four other things that are more important than, than the location. So how, uh, Abba, how, how much time should I, I know I think this goes until 630. I'm just looking at my slides and everything we have. I know I'm, I, th I think much? I think normally we try to wrap it up around six thirty. Okay, we, and that's including uh, the Q and A. Yeah. Okay. But we have included the Q and A as part of your presentation. Normally we leave it, you know, to the end. But now, you know, yeah, we are flexible. You can, you can go a little bit even above it. That's all right. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, I'll try to I'll try to speed up so we get through all the slides and that way we leave ample time for for Q and A. So when we so we've been talking about the tenant kind of the tenant criteria, right? So let's get into the risk of of commercial real estate. Tenant moves out, as I've talked about and mentioned before, right? Once that tenant moves out, it could be a long time for you to get another tenant in there. And then you might have to do major renovations. So to me, right, a tenant moving out or a tenant defaulting, right? Those are kind of the same thing, right? Those are probably number one outside of a natural disaster. But again, I, I'm looking at things as if you're not on the coast, but you could say, yeah, natural disaster is possibly number two. Area goes bad. So this is something similar to to like a Detroit situation where you have a big employer leave. And then if that big employer leaves, then the household income goes down, then people can't afford to, you know, they can't afford a day, the daycare that's there, or they sent you know, or they're, they're moving out to follow another employer. So the area goes bad and then your tenant eventually kind of dies and they themselves have to have to leave. So the area going bad, that's, that's obviously a risk. And then competitor of an area moves close by. So this is something that happened or that has happened because I guess it's still ongoing. And so the, the, the end result has yet to be determined, but I have a, there's a dental property that we own in Chicago, uh, more North kind of in Wrigleyville and another dental practice opened across the street. So it will be interesting to see what, what happens there. And so my tenant, they actually closed the doors for a little, so they continued to pay rent. So they have eight or nine different locations. I think they're running into staffing problems. So it's not that they weren't financially successful, but they, they, they were having seven problems. So they had to close for a little, it was while they were closed that the, this, this other dental tenant moved across the street. So my tenant, they're actually reopening their doors, but it will be interesting to see what what happens with two dental practices right across the street from from each other. Interest rates going up. So this is going to impact. So usually when you're buying a commercial property, you're getting a a, a mortgage that is amortized over 25 years, but the term is up over five. So a five over 25. So after five years lapses, the, as long as you had, as long as your tenant has, has renewed their lease, most likely the bank is okay with lending you your money so that you don't have to pay it off. Cause in essence, it balloons after five years. The issue though, is your interest rate will reset. So as long as you're locked in during a five-year period, right, then you might be sheltered from the high interest rates. So we you know, back when interest rates were at the low point, so December of 2021, we locked in three of our properties between three and three and three fourths rates. So we have until 2026 before those rates will most obviously they'll go up. It's just a question of we've kind of missed that the high point there. So we're fortunate that we locked in for five years and then now we've missed the high rates of eight percent. By you know, a year and a half, are they going to be closer? I, I would think they're probably going to be closer to five and a half, six. So they're still going to be above the three that we had, but three is historically very low. So we we got this huge benefit for five, six years. And now we're going to, it's going to be more normalized. But you can be a little, depending on when you get the mortgages, you can be a little sheltered from the interest rates. But where the interest rates really impact you is the cap rates. Because if the interest rates go up to entice a buyer, right? You have to lower your price. So that's where, so if you're trying to sell, it doesn't matter that you have locked in a low interest rate. If the next buyer, right? If they have, if they're facing the current market interest rates. So if you really want to sell, you're going to have to lower your price. So interest rates going up, that's a risk there because of potential buyers. If you don't want to sell and you're saying, Hey, I'm holding this property for the next 20 years, then that's not going to be as much of a risk. Other than every five years, where you had to, where you had to reset that that interest rate. So capex is higher than projected. So this gets into you know, going. I'm using the roof because that's the easiest thing for for per capex. If you let's say you bought a place and you thought that the roof was new, so you thought, okay, well, I won't have to replace it for 20 years, and then you're five years in, 
and you realize, okay, well, the tenant keeps on complaining about leaking roof. You get your contractor out there and you realize, okay, well, this roof that you thought was new actually is fundamentally bad. We're going to have to replace a roof. And because of the high inflation with construction costs, you're going to pay 70000 So not only are you going to pay more than you thought, so you projected 50000 but you also projected 20 years in the future. Now it's actually four years in. So that happened with one of my properties. That's why it's so specific. But that that's a risk right there is that your projected CapEx is high, it's one higher and then two more frequent than, than what you thought. So financial analysis. So let me jump into this. That'll probably be probably the last thing we'll talk about and then we can get into Q&A. So let me share my other screen. Can you see my cell file? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so when it comes to, so we talked about the risk, right? Now let's look at the reward. All right, so to me, it's it's pretty straightforward when looking at the potential reward of a of a property, right? You just throw it in Excel. You have a financial analysis here. You you factor in the income, you factor in the expenses, you calculate the IRR. So let me walk you through right, what this looks like with an actual property that was on the market. So you can see. So this is, this was, I found this on Crexy, which uh, with a little bit of time, I can show you what Crexy is. It's just a, it's a free website. You, everyone here, you can just create an account for free. You can go on there and you can look at thousands upon thousands of commercial properties that are listed. That's where I've found five or six properties. So it is, a, it's a good website. So here we have the offering memorandum. So we see that the building, right? It's about 7,000 square feet, right? So I just throw that in there. This just gives me a price per square footage just to give me an idea, rough idea of what's reasonable, what's not. Right? The NOI, so it's 144000 So this we can look at as, as the rent. We have the purchase price of $1.95 million. So I throw that in there. Right? And then now we're looking. So we don't have, this isn't the lease. So if I were to move forward with this deal, I would ask the realtor to say, hey, I've looked at the OM. I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm interested. Please send me the lease so I can read it. Most of the time they will. Sometimes they'll say, well, we need you to sign an LOI or to sign or to at least start negotiating on a PSA, a purchase sale agreement before they send you the lease. So a lot of times the OM has general information, but again, you still have to read the lease. So here we can see that oops, sorry. we can see that they're calling it. I would call this a triple net. They're calling it a double net because roof and structure is not included. So what that means then is th this tenant will pay for real estate taxes. They'll pay for insurance and they'll pay for small repairs. They won't pay for major repairs. So they say roof and structure, but I would also read the lease to say what happens with the HVAC, the furnace, plumbing, electrical. So those are four other things that you want to figure out and, and see who's responsible for it. Right, so we have the NOI, so we have that there. And this is just to show what would happen. So a lot of times it you might end up you might end up paying the so in these situations, you might end up paying the real estate taxes and then the tenant reimburses you. So that's what I've factored in here is you have to pay the insurance, you have to pay the taxes, but the tenant reimburses you, so it washes out. But I just want to show you how it might look in the in a financial analysis so even though the money goes out or even though the money goes out the money comes back in because they're reimbursing you so then you have appreciation this appreciation is from the two percent growth rate and then you have principal pay down so then when you're looking at so can you so you see my cell file, correct? Or no? Yes. Yeah. And then, so I have two people saying, the, are you referring to the link to this recording? What is, what is that? I wasn't quite sure what, what, what is being asked. 
Oh, for oh, for this this financial analysis. I don't know whether they are talking about that or something else. Oh, okay. Oh, you're. Oh, I thought that was to me. You're responding to the other one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I thought that was. I thought that was me. Sorry. No, that that there was a there was a question about the link. Okay. Yeah. I okay. Think all right. Link to all these recordings that they are not available right now. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I thought you were asking me. I was like, I don't have a <laughs> have a link. Yeah. <laughs> no. All right. So we have the financial analysis. We have so we have the income up here. We have all the expenses here, right? So keep in mind this debt service. This debt service includes principal, pay down, and interest. All right. So that's why down here, right, this principal pay down, I actually added back. A lot of people don't do that because I think they're thinking more like what cash do you actually receive at the end of the day? I look at it from an equity standpoint. So if you're creating a net asset valuation every month for investors, right, you're not gonna, you're not expensing this principal pay down. So that's why I add it back when doing a financial analysis. All right. So what we can see is that if we're doing this at 70% loan to value. Right. We at the front 585 for the down payment. And then there's closing costs. So closing costs you can generally look at is one and a half to two and a half percent. So here you can see I'm referencing one and a half percent. So this is the money. This is your all in cost of so 614. So you're fronting 614. You're then saying that your equity is going to go up for 10 years of all of these amounts here. You can see you have CapEx projections right here. And then you have a huge one in, in, in year 10. This is me just being conservative because I want to emotionally, when I'm buying a property, I want to be, I want to overstate CapEx because that way when things pop up, it doesn't stress you out. And you're like, oh, I've already projected that our financials are fine. So that's why I've gotten in the habit of overstating what I think is happening with CapEx. And then you, so we're factoring appreciation every year. So then when you sell it, Right, we're assuming that we're selling it for the same cap rate that we bought it at. Right, so we acquired it at seven point three eight percent. We're then selling it at three eight percent. So you can see that even though we're buying it and selling it at the same cap rate, our property has actually appreciated. That's because we had two percent rent growth. So when you're selling it, right, the next seller is going to look at next year's income. So they're going to look at NOI here of 182 minus the expenses here, that's why you see the appreciation. So you can see the appreciation down here. So even though the cap rate stays the same, right? The, the, the valuation of the property goes up every year because the NOI from the 2% is going up, right? So that's why 2% that's why might not sound like a lot on paper, but you're magnifying that because you're using leverage. So that 2% is, more closer to 14% every year. So it actually is much more impactful when you're using when you're using leverage. So something like 2% can actually get you a pretty good appreciation in, in a property. And so then you have to factor in that you're selling, you're paying off the mortgage. So then you're summing up all of this column here to look at your IRR. And you can see that it's about 15, 16%. All right, so now the question is, well, what are our assumptions? Right, so we're using 70% loan to value on a commercial. That's probably as high as you can go unless you have a really good relationship with the banker. So we, we're not really going to be able to change that. But then let's look at our interest. Interest. All right. So our interest cost here, 7.8%. That's no longer relevant. That was re relevant four months ago. Now I would say you could get something like 0.068. All right. So 6.8%. So how much does that change? So that changes about, what was that, one and a half to 2%. 5.8 yeah about one and a half percent so you can see that that does that is impactful right our IRR changes to 17 percent still not that enticing all right keep in mind down here too is that we have two loans that I projected out because our loans are going to balloon every five years so every five years our interest rate is going to change right so maybe at that point so maybe at this point it's six percent is too high so let's do 4.5 percent Right, so now we we get up to eighteen percent. So now what you see is by changing our interest rates, we've went from about a fifteen and a half percent IR up to an eighteen and a half percent IR. So that's a three percent change over that period. That's pretty substantial because I wouldn't I wouldn't really entertain a property if it's less than eighteen percent IRR. 
So it moves it from me saying, okay, I put it in the financial analysis. It's not really worth it at 15% to, okay, 18% is actually, it's actually worth it. Let me do more digging. Let me try to get the lease. And then I can do more, more research there. All right. So we saw the impact of, of interest rate. Now let's look at the impact of the CapEx. So we can see the CapEx here. It's 136,000 throughout. The reason I have that is because I have in today's dollars, you know, 10,000 and then 75. So this roof, I'm assuming needs to be replaced in year 10, right? I, in today's dollars, I said 75. So then in year $10, it's actually a hundred, a hundred thousand, right? So let's just zero those out. Let's just say none of those are needed, right? So we're at 18.41. So zero, zero, 18.41 moves 1%. So we can see what's more important. What's more important, interest rates or CapEx. We can see interest rates are more impactful than, than CapEx. All right now, of course, we're not going to actually project zero, but that's just to show you in this financial analysis, you can play around with the different variables. And if you've created the formulas correctly, you can immediately change the assumptions and it populates so you can quickly see the impact on the on the IRR. Right? And so when I when I buy these properties, I usually project 10 years out because that because that way I see what what's my 10 year return with real estate. I really wouldn't entertain anything if I'm not going to, if I'm not comfortable with holding it for for at least 10 years. So this is this is how I value value a a property. So it's not more complex than your basic financial analysis that you would that you would learn in, in corporate finance. So I know you guys are asking about the correct C now that I know that. So let me pull it up here. Right. So we can take, you know, take a moment to look at this. So you just go to correctc.com. Right. I've logged in and I have a I have a search. So this is throughout the whole US for properties between one and what one and two million here. So now we're seeing, so this, so we have a dollar general store, dollar general store, dollar general store, family dollar, never buy a family dollar store. You have a, you have a bank here. I, I, I personally don't really care for banks either because they tend to move a decent amount. Branches close, they move locations. Like I'm, I'm in Bucktown right now, Chase, there's a Chase in, in the five corners of Wicker Park, Bucktown. They moved like down the street. So from where they currently were. So my experience just personally that I've, what I've seen is banks do move a lot. So I wouldn't personally get into, get into banks because they, they tend to hop around a lot in banks and the locations close. So we got another dollar general store. This is a observation I had as well when I started looking at, at dollar general stores. And another reason why I was hesitant is already, you know, again, this is nationwide this is a pretty general search. We already seen four stores for Dollar General. That might say, hey, why are these Dollar General stores being sold? One reason is because there's 15,000 of them. So, I mean, how many, how many companies have 15,000 locations? So on any given year, there's going to be a lot listed. So it's not necessarily something to be afraid of. It's more, you, you obviously have to, you have to look at all the variables, all the criteria that I, that I listed out, but that shouldn't stop you. Uh, from 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 investing in it just because you say, hey, I've looked at a hundred properties of the hundred ten are dollar general stores. Why are ten dollar general stores being listed? It's because there's fifteen thousand of those locations, and there's not a lot. There's not fifteen thousand other stores, right? There's not. So there's that's just something to keep in mind. That initially I struggled to to wrap my head around. You know how the real estate can invest in the semester, correct? Yeah, I'm not sure with yeah. I'll let I will answer answer that one. So another Dollar General store, we have uh, Autism Academy, Dollar General, Dollar General. See, what you're seeing with these Dollar General stores too is the cap rates aren't really that great. They are moving up. So any cap rate you see, you can add on maybe 50 basis points from a negotiating standpoint, but it's, it's rare that you're going to be able to have a cap rate listed, let's say at seven and a half, and then you get it for eight and a half. Right? Can it happen? Sure, it could happen. But you just got to realize that the negotiate. There's no negotiating where it's you just go in and you say, "Hey, you have for seven and a half. I want to buy for eight and a half. It just doesn't happen that frequently. 
But you can see that the cap rates have been moving up. Last year, these were probably listed at like 6.5% cap rates. So family dollar. Here's, here's medical, pediatrics. So this is something here's here. Oh, that's a CVS. I would stay away from CVS. Look at look at the cap rate too. It's ten percent. It has a because I would think this might be only one or two years remaining. Let's see. Right there. No, it has seven, six to seven years. I'm surprised it's that. Well, CVS hasn't done well from a stock standpoint. So maybe that's, maybe people are just concerned about the health of the company. And then I would also look at is there a competitor in there? What are the chances of it moving out? So anyway, I don't, I, I want to save some time for, so tip, a typical good cap rate is around 8% without raising red flags. Keep in mind, that's only, that's only in this area, in this interest rate environment. So with, when interest rates were much lower, I was entertaining 7%, but now that interest rates have gone up, I, I personally would not entertain a cap rate that's below 8% because I just don't think the financials are, are that enticing. Um, so I would, so, but again, depending on the interest rate, so I would say eight to eight, you know, eight and a half, I would say, yes, I would, I would think that's a very good deal. Eight is kind of borderline where I say, okay, well, let me think about it. Is it a medical tenant right across from a hospital? So, so I would say eight and a half is, is a sweet spot. Now that interest rates have fallen though, I mean, maybe I need to recalibrate my own thinking because they have dropped by, by a percent. So maybe eight is actually okay. So you know, eight to eight and a half, but I, I would still prefer like eight and a half. I think you could get a good place for eight and a half. Just seeing these, seeing these cap rates right now, if you, if you look at these, these cap rates, I think you could get a, a good property for an eight and a half percent cap rate.